Well, UFC 297 has concluded, and my very first thought that I have is, man, I hate Daniel Cormier. The comments he was making about the Arnold Allen fight, just, I, I, I could not believe what I was hearing. Just when I thought we were all on the same page about what the judging criteria was and how it worked in the octagon, this event comes around to ruin all of that. Movzar Evliov, Evloev, the guy who fought Arnold Allen, is insane. Really high-level wrestler, great takedowns, and amazing control from the back. But I was absolutely shocked that everybody was so sure that Arnold Allen was down two rounds. Yet he clearly lost the second round. But the first round... Eve, 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 uh, the Russian guy he was fighting, did not do any damage with his takedowns. Not only did he not do any damage, he didn't even have that much control time. Allen kept spamming the Granby roll button. He was getting back to his feet. Now, his guy maintained control of his back standing. But in my eyes, the guy who did more damage in that round one was Arnold Allen. To me, that was as clear as day. Now, I want to preface this by saying... I haven't been able to go back and rewatch the fight back because the completely legal method I was using to watch the fight, which I cannot stress enough was legal, does not allow me to rewind. So there you go, but I was sure it was going to be rounds one and three for Allen. But Daniel Cormier, oh my god, his wrestling bias is just so horrible to listen to. Also, not to mention, those knees in the third round were legal. They were 100% legal. The fact his hand was lifting every time Arnold threw a knee shows there was not weight being pushed down on him, forcing him down. He was doing that himself. But Daniel Cormier was just 100% sure otherwise, like he always is. And Dominic Cruz going on and on about, oh, well, he has cuts and, and, and damage is important. So if you have cuts, it means you've lost the fight. I just, I, I could not, I was not prepared for this tonight. I, I, I just wasn't. Finally, in the very last fight, John Anik piped up and was like, you know, Dom, if you sustain a cut in a round, that does count towards damage. But just for that round, they're not judged as a whole at the very end of the fight. And Cruz, I don't even, you know, Cruz just, he was too far gone at that point. He, he was way too far gone. Neil Magny, now I will say, I've always felt so bad for him because he is just always a lamb going out to slaughter. It seems like he never has a shot to win. He's just always fighting these young up-and-comers that are supposed to beat him. He's purely used for new guys to elevate their careers and for Gilbert Burns to beat up on. And this fight against Mike Millot seemed like no exception. But he really emptied the gas tank trying to find a finish, and he was dead out there. And it was really great seeing Neil Magny get that comeback win. It just put a smile on my face. It really did. Now moving on. Raquel Pennington versus Myra Bueno Silva. That fight, it, it happened. That fight occurred. They went into that octagon and they fought. Now, Sean Strickland versus Drickus Du Plessis. As I said in the breakdown for this fight, it was just so hard to call between the two of these guys. And that's because leading up to this fight, it was really difficult to tell where their skill ceilings were at. Sean Strickland just put on a striking masterclass against probably the greatest striker that UFC had ever seen. But did he do that because he was a better striker than him, or was his style perfect for Adesanya's style? And then you have Drickus, who just ran through Robert Whitaker, but was that because he was way better than him, or did Whitaker not give him the respect he deserved? Well, we pretty much had every single question we had answered during this fight. It was a super close, real back-and-forth fight, Personally, I had it 3-2 Strickland at the end of the fight. That's how I scored it. Going into the fifth, I thought it was clearly 2-2 with Strickland taking the last round. I'm seeing a lot of people saying, well, the fight was close, but Drickus was constantly marching forward and he got a few takedowns, which, you know, is all fine and dandy, but 
those two things are actually completely irrelevant when it comes to scoring this fight. So, yeah. A pretty popular narrative I saw going into the fight was that because Drickus was going to be the one marching forward, Sean's Philly shell wasn't going to work. But I did not think that. In his fight with Jared Cannonier, Cannonier was walking Strickland back the entire time, and Sean's defense still held up. And during this fight, his defense, it was on point. Drickus has real kickboxing accolades, and you saw his head kicks during this fight were scary. He is super dangerous, but he throws a lot of his strikes very telegraphed. And Sean was seeing a lot of them coming, but a big issue he was having was... Because of all the power coming his way, he wasn't able to find counters. He wasn't able to punish Dinkus' big misses. And because of that, Drykus, he just kept coming, kept moving forward. And as the commentators mentioned, he was getting just a little closer with his strikes as the rounds went on. Eventually being able to land, and he really busted Sean up. You could see he has a lot of power. But even then, Sean was having a ton of success with his jab. Towards the end of the fight, really started connecting with right hands. And his leg kick defense is just spooky. It is so, so, so good. His ability to check kicks, I'm gonna say it rivals Pereira. And like I said, his defense was on point. But the problem is, you can't let a guy as dangerous as Duplessis keep marching forward on you swinging. You just can't. You have to find counters. And they were there when Drickus was missing big. Sean just wasn't finding them. And because he wasn't able to do that, Drickus was eventually able to start connecting. Now, another big question we had about the fight was, how was Sean going to deal with Drickus' takedowns? Now, I had said in my breakdown for the fight that I didn't think Drykus was a super high-level wrestler, but because of how big he is, how powerful he is, how girthy he is, if he gets deep on any shots or is able to get into a clinch, he is going to find takedowns because of his physicality. And that's exactly what happened. But Strickland really exceeded my expectations for how he was able to get back up without taking any damage. I mean, according to the judging criteria, those takedowns meant nothing in terms of scoring. Now, as far as the fight goes, they played a huge role because it was something Sean had to constantly worry about. So don't misquote me, as far as the fight goes, those takedowns were huge. But without a doubt, Sean Strickland can wrestle. That is not in question anymore. But speaking of questions, the other big one everybody had was Dinkus' cardio. And I'll be the first to say it. His cardio 100% held up in this fight. It was really good. And I do not believe him getting his nose fixed had anything to do with it. Maybe a little. It may have helped him out a little bit. But you want to know what the big difference was? In the Robert Whitaker fight and in this fight, he fought way way, way less frantic than he did against Derek Brunson and Darren Till. And that's the real difference maker. He is pacing himself a lot better than he did in the past. But all in all, was this fight a robbery? I'll tell you this, without a doubt, the biggest robbery of the year. Without a doubt. Watching it live, I really had it 3-2 for Strickland. I thought for sure that's what the scorecards were gonna say. But the fight was absolutely incredible. And hopefully we have Drickus versus Israel Adesanya next. I mean, that's the only one that makes sense in my eyes. And something tells me Adesanya gets manhandled on the ground.